So, here we go. Um, uh, thanks, Niels, Christian, and Carsten for introducing us. Um, as I say, it's going to be a great conference. And I'm Chris Saxon, and about six months ago, just over six months ago, something incredible happened to me. I joined the answer team on Ask Tom. Now, this was an amazing opportunity. Ask Tom has been a great resource for the community for many, many years. I mean, how many of you have learned at least one thing from Ask Tom? That's pretty much all of us, isn't it? You know, this has been an amazing resource for the community for well over 15, for over 15 years. And for the vast majority of that time, it was run entirely by, by one guy, Tom Kite. You know, this is a guy who's given a lot to the Oracle community. Not only did he answer questions on Ask Tom, but he also spent a lot of time, he earned about a billion air miles, traveling to conferences such as this to help share his knowledge about Oracle and help us all become better developers, better DBAs. And not only that, he also managed to find the time to write a book or two. So he was a really busy guy. And last year, he decided that he wanted to take a break. He wanted to step down for a little while, take some time to himself. And that was fair enough. You know, he'd given so much to the community, it's fair enough that he wants to take a bit of time for himself for a while. But of course, Ask Tom is an amazing resource. It's a site that gets thousands of hits every single day. There's thousands of page views every single day. So the question came down from senior management, well, who's going to look after this flagship resource that we've got to help the community. So at this point, I'm going to change the story a slightly bit and introduce another guy that many of you will be familiar with. That's Stephen Feuerstein. Now, he's the PL SQL guy. And again, he spent a lot of time traveling, coming to conferences, writing books, helping us all become better PL SQL developers. And a couple of years ago, he decided to rejoin Oracle. And part of his remit was to help to reach out to developers, you know, people like us, and help um, so we can engage and make us more effective Oracle developers when working with the database. So he put together a team of people with different skills to help us all become better developers, Oracle developers. So there's Stephen, um, obviously his focus area is PL SQL. There's Todd, he's our community manager. We've got Blaine Carter, who focuses on open source integration with the database, so things like connecting with Python. Um, we got Dan McGann, a guy many of you may know already. Um, he focuses on JavaScript and Apex. And then you've got myself and Connor. And we are the SQL advocates, so it's our job to help you learn how to write better SQL, work with the database more effectively. And Tom Kite's mantra was always, if you can do it in SQL, do it in SQL. So when the question was, who's going to take over Ask Tom, the answer was already kind of obvious. Stephen calls it vision here. We kind of call it luck. But the answer was that myself and Connor would take over answering questions on Ask Tom. And I said, as I said, this was an amazing opportunity for me. I pretty much learned a lot about what I knew about Oracle um, when I started as a PL SQL developer many, many years ago by reading Ask Tom. So this was, uh, you know, I absolutely jumped at the chance. But as many of you will know, either from reading Ask Tom, following the OTN forums, or pretty much any technical forum, the questions that come in aren't always of the highest quality. Some are a little bit dubious, to say the best. And it was after a batch of particularly bad questions I took to Twitter with this. School is all about giving good answers to questions. What we really need are classes on how to ask good questions. And this is something that's kind of overlooked. You know, In the internet age, in the search age, you think, well, I can search for anything and find it in two clicks. But actually, there are still some things which you can't search for, or at least not directly. You know, Why does my code not compile? How do I make the SQL run faster? You can't really type that into Google and get the answer you want or at least not the exact answer. So sometimes you need to reach out to people. There's always going to be things where you need to reach out to people and ask them questions. So what I thought I'd do is retitle today's talk slightly and call it how not to ask a good question. And I'm going to take some examples of things that have come in to ask Tom since we've taken over and look at them and see 
why they are good or mostly bad examples of questions. Okay, so let's get started. So first up, when you're submitting a question to Ask Tom, there's a little box where you can put a subject, a title about what the question's going to be about. So this introduces it, and it gives myself and Connor a bit of introduction to about what the question is. For example, if it says something like, my PLC will co won't compile, I know I'm going to have to look into that. If it says something like, how do I get um, some SQL to calculate a running total, I know it's going to be about analytics. And I know if it says, how do I get this XML conforming to this X, uh, XSD schema on spatial data in Oracle 9i? I know I'm going to leave that one to Connor to answer. But, <laughs> um, but the fact is, you know, we're going to go through and we're going to read all the, answer, all the questions anyway. We're going to pick them up, whatever that title is. So you might go, well, why does this matter? Well, Ask Tom's a community resource. The reason we do it on this community platform and not just in email is so that we can all benefit. When we answer the question, then it's not just the person who asks the question and gets the answer who benefits. We all benefit. Anyone who's got a similar problem can come through and find that. So the title you give you know, forms the basis of the home page. So that list of recent questions, that title, is what the question is, that question title. And that helps you know, all of us if we go, well, yes, I am interested about um, SQL plan baselines, what's that about? Maybe I can look. Um, and it helps filter out the questions we're interested in and not interested in. But there's another thing. The vast majority of views on Ask Tom come via um, Google search or internet search. And the title also appears in the search results. So this means a couple of things. Um, it gets indexed more better. The indexing of it's better, so a relevant title is more likely to appear in your search results, but it also helps you filter. You know, if you're searching for an answer and it says, ask Tom, SQL tuning, you kind of go, yes, I'm looking for something about SQL tuning. Maybe that will help. And most people do a good job of this. Most people give a reasonably good title. All it is, except for this guy, who's asked not, not one, not two, not three. There's actually many more questions, all of which are simply titled Oracle. <laughs> now. As Connor said when he tweeted about this, um, yes, we know it's about Oracle, or at least we hope and assume it's about Oracle. Come on, help us out a little bit here. Help us out. Now, um, you might say, why don't we go and edit those? You know, why don't we change it to be something more meaningful? And we kind of do. You know, we will go and edit it. But you know, that's just work we don't want to have to do. And also, it kind of sets some expectations for us. I have noticed there is a correlation between how really bad poor quality titles and really bad questions. So if you want to put us in a frame of mind expecting a bad question, just give a meaningless title, and that's one way to do it. But ultimately, this kind of doesn't really matter. You know, it's nice to have, but it doesn't really matter. Um, so the next thing is, how do you start the question? What do you actually say to introduce it? And a lot of people just kind of dive straight in, and they go, I'm trying to do X, Y, Z. I'm trying to write some SQL that does this. I've got some PL SQL that won't do that. And that's absolutely fine. But a lot of people like to be you know, kind of friendly, go with a slightly more personal approach, and introduce the question. And they'll start with something like, hi, Tom. So, and we still get quite a few people asking this. Um, you know, Six months on, since Tom's officially, officially said he's taking a break, we still get people asking this, saying this. But, I don't mind. That's fine. You know, not everyone follows the ins and outs of the Oracle community. I don't really care what you call us. Um, not everyone realizes that Tom's not around. After all, his picture's still on the front page. The site effectively still bears his name. Not everyone's going to know this. But when we answer questions now, at the top, it gives a little picture of who's answered it and what their name is. So even if you hadn't fully known that Tom was taking a break, you could kind of gather this through using the site. You know, if you're just following the questions or submitting new questions regularly, you kind of pick up on this. And a lot of people have. For example, we get quite a few people coming in now. Hi, Tom, Chris, and Connor. This is kind of nice, you know. And we get lots of kind of variations on this. You know, hi, Chris and Connor, or just hi, Chris, hi, Connor, if they saw the last person to answer it. This is all very nice. Um, 
some other people kind of hedging their bets slightly. They're thinking ahead. They're going to go, well, the answer team's changed once. There's a chance that it will change again sometime in the future. We'll just go with a slightly safer, high ass Tom team. And, you know, this is all fine. Um, so most people are picking up at this. All that is, except for this guy, who since the site's relaunched has asked 29 questions, all of which start, hi, Tom. Now, I hope he's, paying, uh, he's, he's just so focused on what the answer is, he's not paying attention to everything else on the page. But sadly, I fear that's not actually the case. But like I said, ultimately, this doesn't really matter. You can call us whatever you want, or you can call me whatever you want. It's probably best not to insult us, but ultimately, I don't really mind. And you know, myself and Connor, we only view each question once or twice. Most views of the question will be, you know, the community, all of us. So, personalizing it, it's nice, but it's not really necessary. So now we get to the kind of real meat. You know, what the question's about. Are you asking a relevant question? And to help with this, we publish a series of guidelines. So these are a set of things, you know, rules, like a little checklist of things to follow when you're submitting a question to see whether or not it's appropriate place for Ask Tom. Um, so we get, and right at the top of this, there's a little line saying, we'll only answer questions on um, Oracle products, or we won't ask, answer questions on Oracle products other than the database SQL and PL SQL. You know, that's the core area of our knowledge. That's what we know most about. It's what we can give the most value to the community as on. Um, so it makes sense that we focus on that. Now, Oracle's a huge company and it owns a lot of products. And several of those fall in a gray area. So one of those, which will be the heart of many of you here, is Apex. Now, this is a fantastic product, um, you know, and it's tightly bound to the database. It runs in the database. It's tightly bound to SQL and PL SQL. But the fact is, I've got very little development experience in it, and Connor's similar. So you know, we, can help, we help where we can. We do our best, but we can't always give good, effective answers on this. Many of you here will know more about Apex than we do, particularly when it comes to things like you know, front-end development, actually interacting, generating user interface. How does the universal theme work? You know, how do I get a button to do x, y, and z? And there's a lot of other Oracle products which kind of fall in this kind of basket where they're closely related to the database. The questions people ask might actually be about database, SQL, PL, SQL, or they might be more about the product themselves. Before Apex came along, and still occasionally now, we get questions about forms. You know, how do I do this? Might really be a PL SQL question, or it might be more of a forms question, which we can't really help with effectively. Um, SQL Developer is another product we get questions on. Now, this is something I use all day, every day, so I'm quite often able to help. But not always. Quite often, I have to ping questions over to Jess Smith, the PM for that, um, to find out you know, what the real answer is. So we, we'll help people where we can. Then there's the more kind of DBA-oriented questions, RMAN, OEM, things like that. So we help people where we can. But these are all kind of closely aligned with the database. As I said, Oracle owns a lot of products. And we do get questions about things like PeopleSoft, JD Edwards, eBusiness Suite. Now, these are things I've got absolutely zero experience in. You know, and I believe Connor's the same. There is very little help we can give beyond you know, doing a basic search ourselves, finding some links. So you can ask these questions on Ask Tom, but we can't provide effective help normally. Um, but these are all Oracle products. It's an Oracle site. People are seeing that. We get some slightly further out questions. So for example, when a question came in, started like this. Explain for SQL queries for DB2 database. Now, someone here is clearly not picking up this is, you know, we're Oracle employees. Um, personally, I've got zero experience developing or administering DB2. Probably not going to spend a huge amount of time learning it to help someone on an Oracle site. So, um, you know, we'll direct people in the right way, but, you know, there's limited help we can give. Um, and then we get some other ones. So this is probably one of my personal favorites for kind of all the wrong reasons. Please help me. I wanted to download Toad into my PC home for practice. Now, there's a couple of issues here. I'm going to overlook the fact that 
this is a competitor's product when we have a perfectly valid, very workable, free alternative in SQL Developer. I kind of overlook the fact, that fact. The thing that really kind of gets me about this is this person took the time to submit this question, type it out, tick the boxes, um, and then had to sit there and wait for the answer. And you know, maybe if they're lucky, they might happen to submit it just as me and Connor are looking at the queue. But most of the time, there's going to be you know, several minutes, a few hours, maybe a couple of days in some instances before we actually pick it up. When they could have just gone here and found the answer in less than 10 seconds. You know, I said that um, some questions are not Googleable, but an awful lot of them are. You know, how do I download X? How do I What's the syntax for Y? Quite often, you just search for them, you get the answer you want straight away. Um, so it always surprises me when people kind of are prepared to wait for kind of basic questions like this. Um, but these aren't the weirdest questions. All of these so far have been about Oracle products, software, software development. We get some truly weird questions come in, such as this one. How do you build a house? <laughs> now, I, if, if, this question is all very vague. Not only is it very vague, but I've got no background in engineering, architecture, bricklaying, and I'm terrible at DIY. You know, I cannot help someone learn how to build a house. So the only advice I can give in situations like this is take some, take some advice from one of my daughter's favorite books and say, use bricks. So, but this probably isn't the weirdest question that's come in. I think that award goes to this one. Why was the Antarctic Treaty difficult to explore? Now, I, this question still confuses me. Uh, I'm pretty sure this must have been somebody's homework. But, you know, that, that doesn't bother me. I don't mind helping someone with their homework. Most of us are, will be parents or are parents and have helped our children with homework at some point. I still just don't understand it. How do you explore a treaty? Surely you just go over it, pick it up, and there it is. You know, read through it. I don't understand how you explore the treaty. Surely what you do is you negotiate the treaty and explore the continent. I'm completely baffled by this one. And maybe some, if any of you know, feel free to come up and tell me later. So as you can see, we get some truly strange and weird questions. Most of them are, do relate to Oracle, but we get some really bizarre things coming in. Um, so it's important to kind of ask questions. And this, you know, it doesn't just apply when you're asking questions on Ask Tom. It's important when you're asking a question of anyone. You know, is it likely to be in their domain of expertise? It's just a waste of everyone's time to write out a question, submit it, wait for them to answer, and then read it, and then just reply back, no, I don't know, or, you know, here's the top links off Google. That's kind of a waste of everyone's time. Um, but there's something that's more important, and again, this is something we put in the guidelines, and we say, you know, the single biggest thing you can do to help us when asking a question on Ask Tom is to provide a test case. So this is a complete set of scripts that we can just copy and paste out of the question into our environment, so we can run it in SQL Plus, SQL Developer, whatever it is. And this enables us to recreate your problem. And there's two reasons why this is important. The first is, it's just, you know, enables us to give you the answer quicker. Without that test case, we're probably going to have to like, type out some scripts, you know, write some create table statements, maybe some inserts, and so on. This just takes time. You know, it's slow, and it takes us a little while. By providing that um, test case, you can get your answer faster. But there's actually a far more important reason, and that's to make sure we give you the correct answer, or the correct answer to the question that you were, you were asking. You know, quite often, when you're submitting a question, things like edge cases actually matter. You know, does your data allow nulls? What are your data types? What dates are you using? Do you have overlapping dates? That kind of thing. And if you haven't included those in your test case and given a full explanation, we might come back with a quick answer, which we've made some assumptions about your question, which turn out to be wrong. And it kind of does what we thought you were asking, but not the thing that you really needed. So providing a test case with lots of examples helps ensure you get the answer you actually needed. 
So I'm just going to spend a bit of time looking at some questions that come in of things that aren't actually a test case. So first up, this one. How to calculate August rate by using SQL query. Now, this was the entirety of the text in the question. And already, we're kind of on shaky ground. You know, it's very vague. Calculate. Calculate how? What's the formula? Are we adding, subtracting, dividing? What's going on here? August. August every year? August this year? August last year? What, what do you want here? So maybe the test case will help us. Let's, let's take a look. Mm, no. This was the entirety of the test case. We've got ID, name, rate, and a bunch of things that look a little bit like months with some per percentages. And this, is, this just has more questions than answers. You know, is this the input data? Is this the answer that they wanted? Who knows? Why do the dates increase by three months from January to April, three months from April to Ju July, and then just two months to September? Again, why were these percentages? 2%, 4%, and 2%. What is going on here? I have no idea. I don't think any of us have any idea what's going on here. You know, how does August sit in here? Do we put it at the bottom with ID 5 and give it 15%? Or do we have to rearrange things? There's so many questions we have that we just can't answer this question. And in situations like this, we, you know, we have to go back to the person asking the question and say, well, you know, what's going on? What do you really want? Um, so it's important to be clear. Fortunately, we don't get questions this kind of vague and nonsensical that often. What we quite often get is things a bit more like this. So we have a question. Is it possible to work on the subset and aggregate using a single SQL to add count invoices for each period as a column? So it's sounding like we, you know, we want some kind of group by and um, account. So we've got some input data like this. And we've got assuming the above data is a subset aggregated is this. And there's our output. So a lot of people seem to think that this is kind of a, you know, a complete test case. We've got some inputs, explanation of what I want, and some outputs. And it's better. You know, we can kind of gather some understanding from the question. But the real problem is this part of the question, the inputs. Um, you know, they've just pasted some results. And what we really, really need are this in the form of create table and insert statements. Now, there's a couple of reasons, again. Um, First up, just converting this into insert statements takes a lot of time. You know, I've gotten really good at find and replace regular expressions um, to convert this into insert statements. But even so, it's time consuming, painful, and nobody likes doing it. Um, but there's still some questions. We've got some these things called periods, which look a little bit like dates. So Jan 16, that looks a little bit like date, but that's not an oracle date. An oracle date has to have you know, a day in it. So have they taken a date and just truncated it to month? Or what's going on here? When we create, so this means when we're creating the table, we've got to make some assumptions about what you're trying to do. And depending on the situation, they may prove to be critical for your scenario. For example, um, if period really is a date, maybe the answer needs to include a conversion so it just shows Jan 16. And this is a fairly trivial example. We get much more complicated ones. And you know, we've got to make some guesses, some educated thoughts about what the person really wants and what it, it is they're trying to do. And you know, we'll get this wrong. And sometimes we'll just plain and simple make a mistake with that create table script. Um, if you've provided that, then we can do that much more. It reduces the chance of that happening. Excuse me. And then we've also got to do the insert statements. Again, we could make a mistake. We might make some assumptions. We might get something wrong, which means you don't get the answer you need. So some of you may be there going, think, well, you know, Chris, you've just told me that's a lot of work, how, how much work that is for you. And I really, really don't want to do all that work. You know, I, why can't you do that for us? Well, I just want to kind of say that if you're asking the question, it isn't really that much work for you. So, for example, if you're using SQL Developer, you're looking at the table browser, you go to the SQL tab, you get the create table statements. So all you need to do is kind of get rid of all the um, storage parameters, unless they're relevant to your question, of course, blank out the schema name, and copy paste that. You know, that's like 10 seconds of work. And we've got every, already, we're already much further ahead in the information we need to help answer the question you have. 
And you, you might go, oh, okay, that's, that's easy enough. And you know, other, there's various ways of doing this, many tools you can use to get the DDL. You might go, oh, okay, but it's the insert scripts that really take the time, isn't it? It's really typing those out and then converting to something that's usable. Well, SQL Developer has this really, really great functionality in it. When you're writing a query, normally you get it in the form of column outputs. If you do this, put this select with this little insert comment in for your query, then when SQL Developer runs it, or if you're using the new SQL CL um, tool, SQL command line, rather than getting your output in the form of columns, you get it in the form of insert statements. And this is really, really cool. So all you need to do is write a SQL query with that insert comment in, and you've got the output you want. Um, you can copy paste that into the question, and then that's, you know, 30 seconds work tops. And that's everything we need, then need to know to recreate your problem and um, work on it to give you the answer you need. So before we kind of, so, and then there's just a side note. Now, when it comes to showing the output, um, you'll show kind of like some columns and table, some rows and columns of how you want it to look. Um, and it's important here to format it appropriately. So for example, we had this one. And although you can kind of figure out, it's not always immediately obvious which values belong under which column. You know, it's, we can kind of figure it out here. But you know, what happens if some of those result columns can have nulls in them, so they're blank? It then gets tricky to know which goes under which. Um, and particularly with more complicated examples. By putting, if we have those nice code tags in, keep it all nicely formatted, we can ensure, we can see what the output you want is. It's much easier to read, much easier for us to figure out, and ensure we're giving you the right answer. So a test case is really important, but there's still things where it can kind of fall down a little bit. You know, um, there's always going to be differences between your environment and our environment. Could be the version, could be the patch set, could be the OS. Maybe some DBA back in the distant past decided to set some undocumented parameters. Who knows? And they may be relevant to the question you're asking. So we have this your um, test case. We copy paste it. And you say, I'm getting this output, or I'm getting this error. This isn't working. And we go, well, you know, it's working fine for us. It's, you know, what's going on? So at this point, we've got to play a giant game of spot the difference. What's you, have you got set in your environment that we don't have set in our environment? Sometimes it's obvious. Sometimes it's just as simple as the version. But a lot of the time, it's something a bit more tricky. And the worst part about this is it's game of spot the difference where each side can only see half of the picture. So now you're kind of doing a guess, guessing game. What's in yours that's not in ours? And this can take a long time to figure out, particularly, as I say, if it does turn out to be something like undocumented parameters. So there's a way around this problem, too. So last year, we launched this um, great tool, Live SQL. So, and this is something you can use in an internet browser, and it basically gives you a lightweight development environment where you can run your own SQL. So if you're building your test case, you can run it, check it works in your environment, or you can run it directly in SQL Developer, run it, paste it there, and see what output you get. So this is already a tip-off point. If there's something weird in your environment, and it's different in SQL Developer, um, Live SQL, you already know that there's some configuration, something different between the two. But there's something even better than this. You can run it, and then you can save the script. So you can save the script and share it publicly. And it gives you a little link here. So you can save that script, take that link, paste it into the question, and then all we need to do is go to that link, run it, and then we get exactly the same output you did. We see the code exactly as you ran it, exactly as you intended it. So we know there's no differences here. If you're getting an error, we'll get an error. If you're getting output you don't want, we'll get the output we don't want. You don't want. And then we can go and modify it, update it as appropriate, so you get what you need. And now, this obviously won't cover all situations. Sometimes your problem may be version specific, in which case um, Live SQL's on 12C. If you've got problems with 10G or something, maybe it's not appropriate. 
Um, but it can still be a good starting point. You can go, we're getting this here. We're not getting it in live SQL. What's going on? Um, and you know, kind of performance questions, again, typically they're pretty hard to recreate in other environments anyway. So, but for a lot of straight up plain, how do I do this in SQL? How do I try and do this in PL SQL? Live SQL is great. So you just need to go to livesql.oracle.com. All you need is an internet connection. You don't need SQL developer, anything like that. Go there, and you can code away. So that's kind of pretty much it. You know, ask us a question that's about Oracle and provide a complete and working test case. And in 95, 99% of questions, we'll be able to give you the answer you want, assuming, of course, you actually asked the question you wanted. As Connor says, the most common response to an answered Ask Tom question is, thanks. What I really want is, then ask that in the first place. And, um, you know, it's almost impossible to put too much detail into a question. OK, you know, if you're copying out pages and pages of stack traces, that's too much, de much detail. But the more explanation about the calculation you're trying to do, the algorithm you're trying to implement, the more examples you can give to support that, the better. We're going to read your question. We're going to take our time. The more information you provided, the more likely it is we'll give you the answer you want. So just you know, take your time, please, and ask what you wanted. And that's, that's kind of it, those three things. Ask what you wanted, ask it about Oracle, and provide a test case. So all that really remains is, you know, well, what do you do while you're waiting for your response? And then there's something about the internet which seems to turn some, just, you know, only a few people, but, but some nice people, once they get behind the keyboard, turn into complete monsters. For example, there was a question which came in one time, and it was a little while before either myself or Connor picked it up. I think it was about 12 hours or so. So a, few, a little while, but not a, a long time. Still, I'm not getting any response. And this person went on to complain that you know, we hadn't picked up the question and given the answer straight away. And as Connor had to point out, we're not a call center. You know, it really is just the two of us. We've got other work to do. We've got families to see. I'd like to get some sleep every now and then. There's, um, he lives in Australia. I live in the UK. So typically, from the time I finish in the evening until he starts the next morning, there's quite often several hours of downtime when neither of us are looking at the queue. And that coincides with the afternoon in most of the US. So, you know, when you're not going to get an instant answer and ask Tom. That's, you know, it is a free service. It really is just the two of us. And it's important to bear in mind. But that probably wasn't the, the worst example of this. So this person waited 12 hours. This person waited a mere two minutes. I hate you for not answering my question. <laughs> Whoa! You know, you're asking us for help. How can you hate us? I don't know what kind of response time they were expecting from a free service where we publish no SLA. You know, we don't give any guidelines saying we will answer your question in X hours. You're not in a call queue where we kind of say, yes, you're, at, you're first in the queue, you will get there in the next few minutes. You know, we'll get to it as soon as we can. We try and keep on, t we keep on top of the queue as best we can, but and most people get their answer within a day. But there's no guarantee you'll get it within a day. Mo it might be a few days. It's rare it goes beyond that, but it's just important to bear in mind. But I, I do want to point out, this really is the tiny minority of people. Most people are really appreciative, really thankful, and come back and say some really nice things. For example, we had this person come back. One four-star review. Not one thanks, Chris. Not two thanks, Chris. Not three thanks, Chris. But four thanks, Chris. <laughs> it's like, OK, OK, you know, I, we've got it. We, we, you appreciate the answer. And you know, it's nice that the people appreciate this. And it's part of what makes um, working on Ask Tom is enjoyable, as people come back and say things like, Thank you. Um, that solved our problem perfectly, and this, you know, is is really good. But um, some people do kind of wonder, and they kind of say, "Okay, well, Chris and Connor, you know, why do you pick up questions on Ask Tom? You know, why do you help people who provided these poor test cases?" So we looked at some examples of some pretty poor questions, and for example, we had this comment come in as a reply to a particularly poorly worded question. When will we learn? 
Why do we not provide simple create insert scripts to support the questions? Why are we so indifferent? Why are we so ignorant? It goes on. When will we learn? Why we take the time to write lengthy question but not provide test cases? Why is Ask Tom and so nice and forgiving, yet we are so lazy? And I think this is, you know, really sad. And it brings me back to the point I made right at the start. You know, school is all about giving answers, good answers to questions. What we really need are classes on how to ask quest good questions. You know, it's easy to forget that not everyone has the same level of experience as we do. You know, many of us have been working with Oracle, reading Ask Tom, answering or asking questions on the OTN forums for many, many years. I mean, who's been doing, working with Oracle for at least five years? Yeah, so 10 years, 15 years, 20 years. It's so, you know, there's still quite a few hands up here. A lot of us have been working with this for a very, very long time, and we've learned this. But as I say, school isn't teaching this. Most people aren't teaching it, taught it on the job. Um, they have to kind of figure it out for themselves. The person at the other end of the keyboard could have any level of experience. It could be anyone. They might be a beginner starting out, or they might have 20 years of experience. Even if they do, then you know, it's up to us to help them. You know, we're all software developers. We all, you, know, you all build real applications that r real people in the real world actually use. Right now, out there somewhere, I'm sure there's someone using an application that either you've helped design, build, implement, support. You know, real people are using these applications in the real world. And, you know, as software developers, we need to make sure that we're keeping these people data safe. It's, it seems that every other week, there's stories about a new SQL injection attack. You know, many of you heard of the Panama Papers. That company was also subject to a SQL injection vulnerability. Now, you might say, yeah, they just helped some, helped some tax dodgers, they deserved it. But what about the broadband provider in the UK who leaked the details of millions of customers in what's believed to be a SQL injection attack? What about VTech, the toy manufacturer, who leaked the details of millions of parents and their children as the result of a SQL injection attack? Now, as software developers, we need to make sure we're protecting people's data. It's not just about loving your data, making sure your privacy settings are correct. It's loving everyone's data. We need to make sure we're building applications that do this, that not only work and perform well, but are secure. And I'm sure all of you do it. I know all of you do it. But there's so many people out there who don't. They're not taught this at school. They're not taught at university. I studied computer science at university, and I didn't learn about SQL injection there. I learned about it by reading Ask Tom. You know, as a community, we need to help fill this gap. We need to bring up the level of knowledge of all software developers so they make sure that they're building applications that run the world today. And we need to make sure we're looking after everyone's data and keeping it secure. So we need to help beginners, whatever their level of experience, whatever level of knowledge they are, and ensure we're doing it. That's why we do Ask Tom. We need to make sure we're making data great again. We need to make sure that application developers are thinking about this, making sure that um, databases are secure when they're building applications so that everyone can feel secure it, that their information is being looked after. There is real people in the real world using your applications. And we need to embrace and work with all developers. That's why we do this at Ask Tom. That's why we work and share our knowledge. As a community, we're stronger. We all learn off each other. Myself and Connor, we don't know everything about Oracle. We know a bit, but we don't know everything. We also rely on you to ask the questions, point out when we made mistakes, um, improve on the answers we've given. We need to make sure people are thinking about this. And it takes all of us to improve the level of software developers everywhere. I know all of you know this. We need to reach out to the wider software community and make sure we're doing this so we're all working and building great applications which protect people's data around the world. This is why we do Ask Tom. So, you know, and this is what I get from it. So, um, I just wanted to kind of finish up. We hope that when you come to Ask Tom, you get um, that gem, gems of information, that little nugget that makes you more effective, you know, helps you solve that problem, helps you build your application so it runs faster, has fewer bugs, um, is more secure. We hope you get that little piece of gold that um, helps you in your, when you're trying to do your day-to-day -day job. 
But I'm still not sure what this person was looking for. I was wondering whether there is a way to perform a gold seek on a set of data using PL SQL. I've, this still completely baffles me. So um, thank you. It's great to see so many of you here as part of the Apex community. Um, I know this is going to be a fantastic conference. There's got a great lineup of speakers. Um, I'm going to be here for the next couple of days. Feel free to come up to me and say hi. Let's all go out there. Let's make data great again. Let's learn about software development, and let's have a great time. Thank you. <laughs> question? That's a good question. So how do we learn, deal with people who aren't, who aren't learning the basics? Well, first of all, you've, I think you've always got to give someone a chance. You know, on last time, or in general, first time, you know, give them, give them a chance and let them start. Um, and then kind of gradually kind of start weaning them off. So, you know, if someone's obviously just kind of relying you, on you as a crutch, then, you know, you can dial back your information. You can go, first time, you know, here's a complete answer, here's a complete test case and so on. Um, second time, well, you know, here it is. Figure out, join the dots for yourself. And then, you know, here's documentation that helps you. Um, so, and ultimately, there is always going to be some people who, who are like that. Um, and it is sad. On, when it comes to answering questions on Ask Tom, we have, I have a slightly different perspective because, of course, it may not just be the person asking that who's got that problem. It could be anyone in the world, you know, there's a community out there. Um, but when it comes to personal interaction, you know, you've got to think about gradually dialing back that um, level of access. So, is that, yeah? Do you have any kind of policies where you say, okay, please put at least some amount of effort in finding an answer by yourself? Um, so, on Ask Tom, you mean? Uh, yeah. So, um, I know myself and Connor don't have official policies, and we do try and help pe people. Um, personally, the more help and the more detail you put in your question, the more help and answer I'm going to give. You know, we do get some kind of one-line questions that come in, and uh, they will typically get a one-line response. So, um, and it's, it's worth noting as well, we don't publish the answer to every question. If someone just says, well, one of the most common questions is, how do I do SQL tuning? And that's kind of the question, that's it. Quite often, it just, the answer is just a couple of links. So, you know, that's... Um, we can only help if the question is meaningful and valid. You know, the, the one that came back earlier, you know, how to calculate the August rate, we can't answer that. You know, we have to go back to the person, and typically we go back and say, please provide us some more information. We can't help you here. There's not enough detail. And then an awful lot of them actually go away at that point. A lot of people, when you go, help us out, disappear. So... Has anyone else got questions? Or we, I think we got. This is a full-time job. It is part of my full-time employment duties, but it doesn't fill all of my time. Um, it does fill a lot of time, <laughs> and so um, you know we are officially. Um, it's part of the things that we do as SQL develop, uh, developer advocates. Um, you know, it, it fills you know up to 20, 30 hours a week generally. It varies, obviously, depending on what comes in. Okay. Oh. Okay. There's a really good question coming in, and uh, for whatever reason you cannot answer it, who do you ask? That's a good question. So if there's a question we can't answer, who do we ask? Um, this, this is where we've got to kind of rely on our network and the people we knew. We rely on the community. Um, quite often when it comes to a question, you know, say someone's got a question about data guard and they don't understand that, if we just don't get it completely, we can reach out to the PMs in Oracle and say, can you... Uh, all the developers in Oracle, can you help us here? We, we just don't know. This, we can't recreate that problem. Um, and some of the times, you know, we kind of just got to go. We, you know, we don't know. We'll submit as much as we can, help as we can give, and then we kind of push it out to the community. We push it out to everyone. And that's what I was saying. Anyone can ask a question, and anyone can submit a review, a comment, a follow-up about it, and say, you know, you made a mistake here, or here's how you could do that better, or you, you, know, you haven't fully answered it. We don't know everything. We can't know everything. Um, and so we need everyone to help bring up all our level of knowledge. So is that, yeah. 
Okay. Thanks, everyone. Have a great conference. Um, it was good to see you all.